Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in Freshman English. And we now turn in our hymnal to pages 476, 477 in the Neil Postman text, The News. However, before we get there, I want to jump back to 464, 465 for just a second. And I want to remind you that we are pairing now Neil Postman's text, The News, with the Sally Ride text that we've already studied, Single Room Earth View at level 2B. Let's pay attention now in your annotations for just a second and at level 2B let's write down what our focus will be for our study of the Neil Postman text and let's take a look now at the literary analysis topic expository essay. Let's remind ourselves an expository essay, write this down, an expository essay is an essay which seeks to kind of present or expose information. The big thing about exposition, and write this down, it's important. The big thing about exposition is that we are not arguing necessarily a viewpoint. We're rather just presenting information. Let me tell you how to do a process. Let me tell you what, um, what uh, statistics are available, etc., etc. And we're just presenting information. That's what we call exposition. Technically, then, if, for example, if you've ever put something together and you had to read instructions, or you were, for example, learning a, how to play a game, a video game, and you read anything about how to do it, what you were reading was actually just simply exposition, okay? Believe it or not, can I say this out loud? After you graduate from high school and go on to university, you will spend 80% or more of your time in college classes reading exposition. You'll pick up your biology text, you'll open to the chapter on photosynthesis, it will tell you about photosynthesis. It's not going to argue, usually, whether photosynthesis is a good thing or a bad thing or something about environmental conditions that are limiting photosynthesis. Normally, you're not going to see that in most college textbooks of biology. Rather, you're just going to say, here's a chapter on photosynthesis. Let me tell you how it works. Bang, 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 bang. That's exposition. So it makes sense to kind of learn how to read this stuff, all right? Notice we've got several things we'll be focusing on on page 465. We'll be talking about description, comparisons and contrasts, causes and effects. And then again, under the reading skill assignment topic, we're going to be looking at main idea, what we call thesis, and of course, points of validation. Let's turn to 476 quickly. We're obviously going to be paying attention again to our big question of Unit 3. Is there a difference for you between knowledge and understanding or wisdom? Notice there's some vocabulary words there that I definitely recommend that you pay attention to as we get ready to study this essay. Let's meet Neil Postman. Notice his dates, 1931 to 2003. And let's meet him now in terms of his biography. Neil Postman was a media critic, a revered professor of communications at New York University where he taught for more than 40 years. He called his field media ecology, and his great concern was the effect of television on Americans. Now, this is already going to begin to kind of date us a little bit for you guys, because of course, all of our statistics are suggesting you guys watch way more on your phones and your devices than you watch TV anymore. In fact, I once had a student who told me, the only time my TV comes on is to play games on the TV screen. In other words, the screen is all I look at on TV. Dude, I do not even look at the TV in terms of TV shows. If I want to watch anything, I do it on my device because I have control specifically about what it is I want to watch. When Neil Postman was alive, that was not the case. You only watched TV. There was no other, there was no internet, there was no online presence. And so you had to go to TV and you just watch TV. It was a, a phenomenon of the late 20th century that began to be a subject of a lot of research and here's why. Increasingly, children were watching more and more TV. And in fact, they started keeping these kind of statistics about the number of hours that young people were sitting in front of a TV and watching a TV. And of course, that led to, well, what are they watching? And who's making the decisions about what they're watching? And there were networks that began to grow up. And the major networks then would present TV. And that was all that you could watch. In fact, believe it or not, there was a day when you turned on your TV and there were only one or two or three channels at all. I mean, that was it. No, it's, it's not like there were, oh, other channels and my TV doesn't get it. No, no, that was all that was made. 
And of course, one channel led to another channel led to another channel. And for those of you who ever do spend any time now on a cable package on TV, you know that there are hundreds and hundreds of channels. And then of course, if you go to things like YouTube and other places, you know that there are tens of thousands of channels that you can now subscribe to. So studying an essay like this is literally like going into a museum and looking at dinosaurs. But having said that, we're going to point out that some of the things Neil Postman will have to say have resonances even for us today. To finish, notice teachings on television. Born in New York, Postman received a doctorate in education from Columbia University. He also wrote 20 books and hundreds of articles. One of his most intense arguments is set forth in The Disappearance of Childhood from 1982, in which he asserts that television exposes children to adult concerns far too early in their lives. Let's go ahead and just write this down right now. Neil Postman argued that by the time you were born, that there was too much adult content that was being shared with you at too young of an age. And we're not just talking about what you might assume like things like, for example, R or even X-rated material that's sexual in nature. No, no. For example, the news shows all kinds of terrible things happening in the world. A tsunami or a volcano or a war or a battle or whatever. And this is just on the news. And the adults are watching it, but you are watching it when you were seven. And Neil Postman argued that when you were seeing that stuff, you were naturally internalizing a certain level of fear, like, oh no, what's going on? Clearly those adults are like really upset. Should I be upset? And you started to grow up way before your time, Neil Postman argued, because of TV and because of the exposure of, especially, the adult content on TV. So when you hear the term adult content, don't just assume that we're talking about sexual types of things. A lot of the stuff that Postman was most concerned about was actually political, and it had a lot to do with conflict, right? All kinds of conflict, or violence, we might say, okay? Of course, this is way before the age of anything called a video game. For those of you that know anything about the history of video games, you know that they actually did start out as real games. In other words, you had a little paddle and you had a little ball and you knocked the ball against the other paddle and those were the earliest days of video games. No way anybody assumed that in 30 years, 40 years, there would be this thing called gaming that would actually consume so much of your guys' time, right? By the way, that do you know, Postman once said, quote, you have to understand what Americans do is watch television. I'm not saying that's who they are, but that is what they do. Americans watch television, end quote. It's amazing to me how antiquated that even that quote is now. If we had to adjust that quote, we would probably say that Americans don't watch TV, but Americans are engaging in their device. That verb engaging is important, right? Because it's now interactive. But all you have to do is go to a mall and just sit and watch and see how people engage with their device at the mall. There was a uh, very interesting video the other day that showed a baseball game and it showed a whole group of 20-somethings who are college age, and you could tell they were all kind of together there to watch the baseball game. And there was a pivotal moment in the game where the entire stadium was just erupting, and there were two cameras that were shooting two different parts of the stadium. One camera was shooting all the, all the fans who were just like losing their ever-loving mind. And then it went over to the other group, and all of them had their phones out, and all of them were looking at their phones, none of them were even engaged in the game. They were sitting in the stadium. They heard everybody screaming and didn't even look up because they were all engaging in their media. And the screen was split side by side. And you saw all the kids who were the 20-somethings. And then you saw all the fans who were, of course, much older, who were really getting into the game. And the commentator pointed out that maybe even sport in America is starting to change because the demographic of who watches the game, right? The background information on page 477, television news. In 1948, look at this stat. In 1948, only 400,000 American homes had a TV. By 1960, more than 46 million American homes had a TV. And TV began to take over as the news medium of choice. Today, television news is one of the most influential institutions in American culture. Now, we're not exactly sure, really, 
when people stopped saying TV news and started saying cable news. For a long time, TV news and cable news were kind of the same thing. And then there began to be a distinction that was made. Today, of course, we call it cable networks and cable news. Now, I realize you're fresh, and so the majority of the news that you're familiar with is either as you're on your way out the door and you walk through the living room where a TV is maybe on and an adult in your life is watching something and there's like talking heads or whatever and there's this script stuff going along the bottom and all of that and you kind of immediately go, oh, they're watching the news. Or it might be that you turn on your phone and you've got a list of three or four major headlines that you kind of flip off before you get onto the thing that is your phone, right, okay? When Postman writes this essay, the only way you have access to the news on TV is to turn on the news, to turn on the TV, go to the channel, and watch the news. Postman, however, was deeply concerned about what was being concerned and considered as the news. Now today, in our political environment, it is a timely essay to look back at this essay and kind of get a sense of what Postman was trying to say. Let's write down a couple of things right away at level one. I'm going to help you with this essay. In this essay, Postman is going to discuss limitations. You want to write that word down at level one. Limitations of TV news coverage. He explains how television's reliance on visual images determines what stories are covered. Because little time can be devoted to analysis or explanation of a story, TV news has become a kind of entertainment with the news anchor as the host of the show. Now, this is Postman at his best. This is Postman write it down as a prophet. When Postman wrote this essay, he could not have imagined what we today have as TV news, where if you turn on the news channel, you really do have a sense that the person who is the talking head is something more than simply a deliverer of information. The way that individual looks, makeup, all of that, the way that individual acts, the way that individual engages with other people. Rarely now do you ever have anybody who just tells the news. Almost always there are other people that that person will engage with. Usually it's someone who agrees with a certain political position and someone who disagrees with a certain political position. So, for example, you can see on a news show that you'll have two people or more who are kind of talking back and forth at each other. And as one of my freshmen pointed out, there seems to be a lot of screaming and yelling that goes on. Well, Postman writes an essay like this long before that time. But... We want to kind of see in this essay a major prediction of what's coming. Now, again, this is an expository essay, but we're going to ask, does this essay increasingly start to read more like a persuasive essay to you? Let's go ahead now and follow along. And again, the challenge for this essay, for me to you, is to actually follow along. Don't just let the reader tell it to you. Read it for yourself and become a really focused reader. Here we go, Neil Postman's The News. The News, by Neil Postman. The whole problem with news on television comes down to this. All the words uttered in an hour of news coverage could be printed on one page of a newspaper. And the world cannot be understood in one page. Of course, there is a compensation. Television offers pictures, and the pictures move. It is often said that moving pictures are a kind of language in themselves, and there is a good deal of truth in this. But the language of pictures differs radically from oral and written language, and the differences are crucial for understanding television news. To begin with, the grammar of pictures is weak in communicating pastness and presentness. When terrorists want to prove to the world that their kidnapped victims are still alive, they photograph them holding a copy of a recent newspaper. The dateline on the newspaper provides the proof that the photograph was taken on or after that date. Without the help of the written word, film and videotape cannot portray temporal dimensions with any precision. Consider a film clip showing an aircraft carrier at sea. One might be able to identify the ship as Soviet or American, but there would be no way of telling where in the world the carrier was, where it was headed, or when the pictures were taken. 
It is only through language, words spoken over the pictures were reproduced in them, that the image of the aircraft carrier takes on meaning as a portrayal of a specific event. Still, it is possible to enjoy the image of the carrier for its own sake. One might find the hugeness of the vessel interesting. It signifies military power on the move. There is a certain drama in watching the planes come in at high speeds and skid to a stop on the deck. Suppose the ship were burning. That would be even more interesting. This leads to a second point about the language of pictures. The grammar of moving pictures favors images that change. That is why violence and destruction find their way onto television so often. When something is destroyed violently, its constitution is altered in a highly visible way, hence the entrancing power of fire. Fire gives visual form to the ideas of consumption, disappearance, death. The thing which is burned is actually taken away by fire. It is at this very basic level that fires make a good subject for television news. Something was here, now it's gone and the change is recorded on film. Earthquakes and typhoons have the same power. Before the viewer's eyes, the world is taken apart. If a television viewer has relatives in Mexico City and an earthquake occurs there, then she may take an interest in the images of destruction as a report from a specific place and time. That is, she may look to television news for information about an important event. But film of an earthquake can still be interesting if the viewer cares nothing about the event itself. Which is only to say that there is another way of participating in the news, as a spectator who desires to be entertained. Actually, to see buildings topple is exciting, no matter where the buildings are. The world turns to dust before our eyes. Those who produce television news in America know that their man favors images that move. That is why they despise talking heads, people who simply appear in front of a camera and speak. When talking heads appear on television, there is nothing to record or document, no change in process. In the cinema, the situation is somewhat different. On a movie screen, Close-ups of a good actor speaking dramatically can sometimes be interesting to watch. When Clint Eastwood narrows his eyes and challenges his rival to shoot first, the spectator sees the cool rage of the Eastwood character take visual form, and the narrowing of the eyes is dramatic. But much of the effect of this small movement depends on the size of the movie screen and the darkness of the theater, which make Eastwood and his every action larger than life. The television screen is smaller than life. It occupies about 15% of the viewer's visual field, compared to about 70% for the movie screen. It is not set in a darkened theater closed off from the world, but in the viewer's ordinary living space. This means that visual changes must be more extreme and more dramatic to be interesting on television. A narrowing of the eyes will not do. A car crash, an earthquake, a burning factory are much better. With these principles in mind, let's examine more closely the structure of a typical newscast. In America, almost all news shows begin with music, the tone of which suggests important events about to unfold. Beethoven's Fifth Symphony would be entirely appropriate. The music is very important for it equates the news with various forms of drama and ritual. The opera, for example, or a wedding procession in which musical themes underscore the meaning of the event. Music takes us immediately into the realm of the symbolic, a world that is not to be taken literally. After all, when events unfold in the real world, they do so without musical accompaniment. More symbolism follows. The sound of teletype machines can be heard in the studio, not because it is impossible to screen this noise out, but because the sound is a kind of music in itself. It tells us that data are pouring in from all corners of the globe, a sensation reinforced by the world map in the background, or clocks noting the time on different continents. Already then, 
before a single news item is introduced, a great deal has been communicated. We know that we are in the presence of a symbolic event, a form of theater in which the day's events are to be dramatized. This theater takes the entire globe as its subject, although it may look at the world from the perspective of a single nation. A certain tension is present, like the atmosphere in a theater just before the curtain goes up. The tension is represented by the music, the staccato beat of the teletype machines, and the sight of news workers scurrying around typing reports and answering phones. As a technical matter, it would be no problem to build a set in which the newsroom staff remained off camera, invisible to the viewer, but an important theatrical effect would be lost. By being busy on camera, the workers help communicate urgency about the events at hand, which it is suggested are changing so rapidly that constant revision of the news is necessary. The staff in the background also helps signal the importance of the person in the center, the anchorman, or woman, in command of both the staff and the news. The anchorman plays the role of host. He welcomes us to the newscast and welcomes us back from the different locations we visit during filmed reports. His voice, appearance, and manner establish the mood of the broadcast. It would be unthinkable for the anchor to be ugly or a nervous sort who could not complete a sentence. Viewers must be able to believe in the anchor as a person of authority and skill, a person who would not panic in a crisis, someone to trust. This belief is based not on knowledge of the anchorman's character or achievements as a journalist, but on his presentation of self while on the air. Does he look the part of a trusted man? Does he speak firmly and clearly? Does he have a warm smile? Does he project confidence without seeming arrogant? The value the anchor must communicate